muted now? Okay. No, you're not muted now. Oh, really? Yeah. There it goes. I was going to say, if you were to happen to poot or something, this would be all over YouTube, and I would laugh the whole time. <laughs> anyway. I'm, I'm struggling. It's okay. We're here for you. We're here for you. Okay. All right, so we had, um, last night, all around the world, we had, I posted it earlier. We As I was looking through, all of the stuff on social media, there were groups of 5, 10, 20, 50, 100, literally all over the world celebrating the summer solstice. From I mean, they were doing it in all kinds of ways. Some of them were trying to be as authentic as they could. Some of them were, were simply getting together to um, raise a horn and do the best they could with what they had. And I, and I think that's an interesting thing. If you looked, I saw Stonehenge there were literally thousands of people at that ancient site watching the the solstice sun of the summer rise. It was really an amazing sight. And now we start, every day from now gets a little bit shorter. We've lost the light of the world. We've lost um, that intensity of spring, of new growth, of rebirth. And now we're kind of in this I don't know how to say it, but now we're going down to winter nights and on into Yule, which are all great celebrations. The wild hunt begins, Yule begins. <laughs> and as we look at this death of Balder in the lore, I'm going to talk about the Prosetta tonight. And there's some things in here that, that touch on what it might look like when we also pass not only down into Yule, but as we pass into a different realm of our existence, what happens when we die in this faith? <laughs> Nobody really ever answers that question. I mean, I think the Theodish were the first that really kind of come up with the idea of going to the halls of our ancestors. But the idea that when people die, they're going to go to Valhalla is still a predominant thought process. It's still the idea of, well, I fought against cancer. Uh, I'm going to go to Valhalla. That is still technically qualified as a straw death. There was something about the transition to Christianity, which, which created this hesitancy, created this trepidation of people that died a straw death, that didn't die in adventure or some great act of heroism, that were not engaged in some martial activity, so they might enter Valhalla and fight a Ragnarok. And yet I can't help but sit here and think that anatomically correct humans have been around for 130,000 years. And that that in Northern Europe, 15 or 20,000 years, in Central Europe for 50,000 years, I cannot help to think that that would be the limit of the development of what they believe their afterlife might be like. <laughs> Especially not when we have such a depth of material and knowledge and ideas that come from ancient Egypt, ancient Greece, uh, Sumeria, from the, uh, from the Rig Veda, <laughs> the ancient cultures of India before any kind of Aryan migration took place that were already fully developed. There's a wealth of material there. During this transition to Christianity, we find doubt cast upon what it might be like when we pass away. If you're not a warrior, you're going to die a straw death, and you're going to go down to this terrible place called hell. I think this is one of the first things that wounded our ability to have a faith that provides any kind of depth for people in time of need. I think it's the first thing that wounded... <laughs> what might be perceived as the depth of our faith for people as they began to get older in years. It robbed the sage, it robbed the old king of his ability to be wise. It robbed the old farmer, the grandfather, the great-grandfather, of their ability to provide comfort and hope to children who may have simply been afraid in the storm. 
But we'll start here with Balder. Then when Balder was fallen, words failed all the Aesir, and their hands likewise to lay hold of him. Each looked at the other, and all were of one mind as to him who had wrought the work, but none might take vengeance. So great a sanctuary was that place. <laughs> so this is kind of where we are today. Balder has fallen. The days are getting shorter. There's no vengeance to be taken. This is a part of the cycle. For us, we had the great celebration to celebrate the long, shining light of the sun and life and everything we've accomplished from, you know, the charming of the plow on. But when the Aesir tried to speak, then it befell first that weeping broke out so that none might speak to the others with words concerning his grief. And that little line right there is the big hint. This misfortune falls to everyone in life. And we fall to weeping first, but that says that none might speak to the other with words concerning their grief. How isolated must an individual be when they have to deal with death and their family <coughs> and the faith that they've chosen to follow, <coughs> excuse me, cannot provide words to speak to each other concerning their grief. I think we find ourselves in that situation more often than we want to be. It was the most perplexing part of my role and responsibility as a Gothi to try and counsel a woman when her, father, when her husband died. And it was difficult for me to deal with when my father died. This young woman who was one of the first heathens that I met in Ossetru, her husband had passed away, and there was certainly a futility involved in trying to use all of this to help her deal with her grief. And it says right here, even the Aesir had difficulty expressing words to each other concerning their grief. And it goes on that Odin bore that misfortune by so much the worst as he had most of the perception of how great harm and loss for the Aesir were in the death of Balder. <coughs> every great father, every all father, every grandfather, every paternal figure in a family understands what's going to happen when someone they love loses someone. More often than not, it's because they have already been through life. Many of them have been warriors, and many of them have seen death, and they know what it's going to feel like. <coughs> Same thing with their grandmothers. They've watched people struggle. They've watched people deal with pain. And yet, for some reason, we're finding a great deal of difficulty finding that course of counseling or finding that course of thought process to enable people to be able to deal with this one great shortcoming of our faith. How do we fix that? Now, when the gods had come to themselves, Frigg spake and asked who there might be among the Aesir who would fain for have for his own all her love and favor. <laughs> and we do this kind of bargaining thing with ourselves when we deal with death, when we deal with loss. We begin to negotiate with those around us. I would do anything not to feel this pain. And it's, it's a... Uh, it's a real example here of what we got to do to deal with it. People will give all their love and all their favor to one thing or idea or aspect of their life or hobby or <laughs> anything so that they don't have to deal with that pain. We're not providing instruction in this faith how to deal with that. I, I challenge anyone that listens to this, find that one example of someone that's telling you, giving you the kind of encouragement, giving you the kind of reinforcement to help you deal with this single-mindedness of purpose devoted to avoiding that pain that we all go through. We all lose someone special in our lives. How will we deal with that? <laughs> what's it look like? What comfort can we offer these individuals? What strength of mind and heart and soul might we 
lend them, when we mix our might and main with them, that they might be able to make it through this without being distracted and focusing all their attention in one thing that doesn't help them grow. She continues on, let him ride the road to hell and seek if he may find Balder and offer a hell a ransom if she will let Balder come home to Asgard. So she's going to negotiate. So we have the great stages of grief are listed in there. She's going through all of them. Now she's going to, now she's going to continue that negotiate. She's going to buy her way out of it. And his name is her martyr, the bold Odin's son. So we have Baldur's brother. He's pretty upset. He's also willing to undertake whatever it takes. So he doesn't have to, so he can bring his son, his brother back. He can be the hero. He can avoid dealing with this pain, but quite by accident, <coughs> this great journey also helps him to become a man. He undertook that embassy, and then Sleipner was given Odin's steed and led forward, and her martyr mounted on that horse and galloped off. Sleipner is that eight-legged horse, and if you're, and it bears a striking resemblance, <coughs> excuse me, I, there is, once four people carry a body to the funeral pyre, it has eight legs. So this is Sleipner. This is kind of where Sleipner comes from. The, when the uninspired human intellect or the rampant ego that's trying to rob somebody out of their hard work, usually it leads to death. There's something there that's going to cause problem. There'll be sickness, there'll be resentment, there'll be pain, there'll be grief, there'll be death. That is always <laughs> the course of those individuals who spend all of their time agitated about some idea, issue, or thought process or screwing somebody out of something or always agitated and angry. The old people, the old men by themselves that um, are just rapidly angry about stuff that really has nothing to do with their life. It always leads to an early grave. That stress always affects the heart. This is the, this is the, the uh, offspring, the spawn of that uninspired human intellect. The ego is that horse that allows people to ride to the next realm. Egdrasil is also Odin's steed. That is also the gallows tree. That is <laughs> where you might kill a part of yourself to become something more. All of that is taken into thought and consideration here when they lose their favorite son. So her mother mounts this horse that has the ability to transverse the realms to enter the realm of the dead. <clears throat> it's a pretty special ability. That's a pretty unique characteristic. Are we to believe that her martyr passed away to uh, find his brother? Did he sacrifice himself to find his brother? Or did he sacrifice that aspect of the boy to become the man? Which I think is probably much more relevant. The Aesir took the body of Balder and brought it to the sea. <laughs> Ringhorny is the name of Balder's ship. It is the greatest of all the ships, and gods would have launched it and made Balder's pyre their own, but the ship stirred not forward. The word was sent to Jotunheim after that giantess who was called Hero King. That means shriveled woman or fire, fire smoked. It means fire smoked. When she had come riding a wolf and having a viper for a bridle, then she leaped off the steed, and Odin called to four berserks to tend the steed, but they were not able to hold it until they had felled it. So when the fire shriveled, when this wildfire comes down out of the mountains, it's going to take a lot to stop that from moving forward. It's kind of what we're talking about here. And Odin, the berserks, put a stop to it. It takes that kind of effort to stop the wildfire. Then Hurricane went to the prow of the boat and thrust it out with the first push so that fire burst from the rollers. And all lands trembled. Thor became angry and clutched his hammer and would straight away have broken her head had not the gods prayed for peace for her. <laughs> the warder of men is taking steps to pay attention to that that might offer uh, more damage to what's going on here. Then was the body of Balder borne out on the ship, and then his wife Nana, the daughter of Nep, saw that straight away her heart burst with grief and she died. She was born to the pyre and fire was kindled. <laughs> the first prayer of the victory bringer, Sigurdrifer, Brunhilde. Hail the day and hail the night and her daughters too. Look on us now with loving eyes. 
Balder means literally the shining day. Hail the day and night and her daughters too. Nep is the goddess of night. She's saying her first prayer in this relationship to a couple of individuals who truly espouse that union of a man and a wife. She is calling out to, to Balder and to Nana, that loving couple who traversed the most dangerous course of life together. They don't separate and split up when times get tough. They stick together and they, tr and they go through this different path. I mean, you have Asgard up here and Odin and all, they're doing all their stuff. And you have Balder in hell with his wife, the, the shining day and the daughter of night, that real equal opposing of competing forces, traveling their own path, learning their own lessons, far removed from the rampant ideologies of the uninspired human intellect. So there's a real blessing here when we celebrate the summer solstice because now we have a hero who has gone on a path of growth that if we could mimic, if we could emulate, if we could incorporate into our own lives, we too might be able to step forward someday as something truly magnificent. Because I think that's the hope for everything we do here. Aren't we doing something here at Following This Faith that's going to allow all of this stuff we feel in our heart to really become something magnificent? Are we going to be able to step out of this someday and say, I follow also to the success of my life looks like this. And I'm not waiting on something out there to fix what's going on in here. All of us are hoping for that. All of us are looking for that. We're all waiting for it. The uninspired human intellect and all of those beings in Asgard get suckered by the righteous indignation of hating this or hating that or battling, constantly battling some idea or ideology that's put in front of them because somebody else couldn't think straight. Somebody else didn't want to be slighted. Somebody else wasn't the center of attention or as important as somebody else. And yet we have two gods, <laughs> actually three, that are taking this different path through a realm that most people have here mostly considered to be a dark and foreboding place, a place that has had doubt cast on it as to being worth anything. Yet you have the shining day and the daughter of night sitting there regally. <clears throat> then Thor stood by and hallowed the pyre with Mjolnir. Mjolnir is that unique tool and I spoke about it last night during the blow. It is the crusher. It is the destroyer. It is the bringer of lightning. But it is also that tool and implement that is most powerful in the naming ceremony. That great image as we sprinkle that conduit of spiritual energy upon a child when we name it. <laughs> it is also a creator. In the Albus Mall, he said, Thor says, I alone am God of marriage. And when they lay a hammer in a lap, there's a new creation there. There's a new unique entity and couple. <laughs> so he also hallows the pyre of the dead. That also is a rebirth, a destruction and a rebirth, something special, something pure that that energy might move through to the next world without contamination of uh, all of those things that hinder us in this world. <laughs> Before his feet ran a certain dwarf, which was named Leter. Leter means color. Thor kicked him with his foot and thrust him into the fire, and he burned. So all the color is now out of the world. Things are becoming dark and gray indeed. People of many races visited this burning. First to be told of, his, of Odin, how Frigg and the Valkyries went with him <coughs> and his ravens. So Odin, the All-Father, the one who has sacrificed that part of himself to allow him to grow into a being worthy of ruling Asgard. His wife, Frigg, who knows every bit as much as he does, though she's not running around talking about how smart she is. All of the Valkyries, those, those beings that have been romanticized as the individuals that escort the dead of the battlefield to Valhalla, and the ravens, memory and thought, Hugin and Munin, who tell Odin everything. <laughs> That's a pretty impressive retinue in and of itself. But Frey drove his chariot with the boar called Golden Mane. Frey is that 
Vanic God of springtime and sunshine and spring rains, and his boar shines as brightly as the sun as well. So there's almost a Vanic idea of a solar deity <laughs> that comes to honor this loss of the shining day, otherwise named Fearful Tusk. And Heimdall rode on a horse called Goldtop. So as Thor is the warder of men, Heimdall is the warder of heaven. He is the one that slays Loki at Ragnarok. So it is the guardian of heaven, that one that allows passage into those higher trains of thought, those higher ideas of being, those higher aspects of who we might become. Heimdall is the one that guards entrance to that across uh, the Rainbow Bridge. <laughs> He's the one that kills the uninspired human intellect, the ego at Ragnarok, to allow something great to be born. They cancel each other out. You can't grow into something greater if you don't know what you have to get rid of. Odin had to figure that out as he hung on the tree for nine days and nights. It took him that long to figure out what part of him needs to die for him to hear the songs of his ancestors and to pick up those runes. And Freya drove her cats, those symbols of fertility and abundance. Thither came also much people of the Rhyme Giants and the Hill Giants. So even the simple beings of the world, even the the, the beings of the cold and the frost and of the hills understood that something has been lost here. It's kind of like when a, an old president dies, you see the Democrats and the Republicans come to pay their respects because something has been lost. Some element of statesmanship is now no longer there to provide guidance. With the sun's gone, things are gonna become different for the rhyme giants and the hill giants. Odin laid on the pyre that gold ring, which is drought near, this quality attended it, that every ninth of night there dropped from it eight gold rings of equal weight. <laughs> if you're a chieftain and you have what it takes to give out eight gold rings of equal weight every night, you are a powerful chieftain indeed. You can build an army undreamt of because we're talking about the golden armbands that, that when a soldier comes up and says, I pledge my allegiance and my loyalty to you, here's an armband and it's a bond between us. <coughs> to give out eight every night, that's a wealthy, powerful king. So Odin is doing this thing as his son begins this journey. Hey, um, I'm going to make sure as your father that you have every resource necessary so that you can conquer what you're coming across. So he's kind of tilting the, tilting the balance in favor for his son right off the bat. Baldur's horse was led to the bale fire with all his trappings. So he's given a horse as well. <laughs> now this was to be told concerning her martyr, that he rode nine nights through dark dales and deep so that he saw not before he was come to the river Giol and rode onto the Gill Bridge, which bridge is thatched with glittering gold. Maud Guder is the maiden who guards the bridge. So this is where it gets real interesting to me. For Maud took Sleipnir and journeys to the realm of hell, but he's got to travel nine nights through dark tales and deep. Odin hung on the tree for nine nights. <laughs> This is a period of birthing. This is a cycle of, of life for humans, basically. So he rode through this entire birthing process, nine nights through dark dales and deep, so that he saw not before him, he was come to the river Giol and rode onto the Giol Bridge, which bridge is thatched with glittering gold. So now there's a river to cross, but there's a bridge there and it's thatched with glittering gold. And there's a maiden there who guards the bridge. So to enter this realm of hell, now all of a sudden we find out there's another bridge to cross and it's, and it's covered in gold. So it's not some decrepit old thing. It's not buying, giving a coin to carry on the ferryman to cross the river Styx. <laughs> We have a bridge to enter the next realm of our existence that's covered with glittering gold and there's a maiden there named Modgutter. And that's who we got to deal with him. And she asked him his name and face, his race, saying that the day before they had ridden over the bridge five companies of dead men, but the bridge thunders no less under thee alone. 
and thou hast not the color of dead men. Why ridest thou hither on hell way? He answered, I am appointed to ride to hell to seek out Balder. Hast thou perchance seen Balder on hell way? She said that Balder had ridden over Gil's bridge, but down in north lieth hell way. <coughs> down in north is going to typically be cold. This, now we're talking about getting into the underworld, that great idea of caves that men sought shelter in, but the depths of which terrified them in, in no small circumstances. In some caves, you'll find that men, after they'd come across fire, the some kind of individual will go deep into those caves and create cave paintings and ideas. This is a place not your regular person would go. I mean, you certainly don't want, if you're a, a caveman living in a cave, you don't want your kid running off to the darkest part of the cave because who knows what's back there. Things change. It gets quieter. It gets colder. It's a very ancient and old fear. <laughs> but we have this, we have Heimdall that guards the, the rainbow bridge to heaven. We have Mo, Modguder and Maiden who guards the bridge into hell. So there's a bridge there that we've got to cross, and there's someone that's paying attention to all of it. Let me see. I need to look that up because I'm going to find out. It means furious battler. And the gyol is noisy. So there's the furious battler guards the bridge into the afterworld, and she's having this comfortable discussion with her martyr. He tells her, look, I'm on a mission. Don't fool with me. The furious battler, it guards that bridge. Is it she that lends us strength as we lay there on our, on our sick beds to battle things like cancer or sickness or Lou Gehrig's disease or any of the other thousands of diseases that cripple individuals before they pass? Is she the one that gives us strength to continue to fight, that furious battler, that person that helps somebody cling to life? Who knows? <laughs> but we got to cross over a noisy bridge. Lots of people march over that bridge every day, five companies of men in one day. And yet her martyr, this champion that rides through there with Sleipner, that escort to the, to the, to the uh, funeral pyre that Odin makes a personal mount of, creates quite a stir as he encounters the furious battler. She's not there to battle him. <laughs> then her martyr rode on till he came to hell gate. He dismounted from his steed and made his girths fast, mounted and pricked him with his spurs. And the steed leaped so hard over the gate that came no wise near it. Then her martyr rode home to the hall and dismounted from his steed, went into the hall and saw there sitting in the high seat, Balder, his brother, and her martyr tarried there overnight. So he breaks into heaven. He breaks into the afterlife. He clears the high hurdle, the high wall. He doesn't, he's made that great leap with his horse that he didn't even come near it. Jumped right over, enters the great hall, and they're sitting in the high seat. Not some secondary couch or guest, but the high seat itself is Balder. And Hermod tarried there overnight. <laughs> when a brother comes back from a long journey and gets to work with the younger brother or talk with the younger brother, there's a lot of wisdom that's shared. There's a lot. Of, same thing with a older sister after she gets married, talking to a younger sister. There's a bunch of wisdom and compassion and things that are shared because there's a lot of uncertainty with the youth about what's going on. And there's even more so in today's world when men and women are failing to indulge in those man-making ceremonies after a life of building a man or those woman-making ceremonies after a life of building a woman. In today's world, <laughs> there's a lot of uncertainty about what does my future look like? What are the challenges I'm going to have to face? Am I up to the task? And usually it's a brother or a sister that helps provide some of that guidance. And as her martyr makes this journey, as he crosses that bridge and engages the furious battler, as he leaps over that high wall and enters that great hall, there is an aspect of her mod that is changing. Because the boy has started the journey. <coughs> now he's going to talk to his older brother, and he's going to engage in some aspects of becoming a man. Because it is the death of a boy for a mother when he becomes a man that is painful. But I digress. At morn, her mother prayed that he prayed hell 
that Balder might ride home with him and told her how great weeping was among the Aesir. But Hel said that in this wise it should be put to the test, whether Balder were all so beloved as has been said, if all things in the world, quick and dead, weep for him, then he shall go back to the Aesir. But he shall remain with Hel if any gainsay it or will not weep. When a man goes on a journey and there's something he has to do, if he's given an excuse not to engage in that activity that helps him become more of a man, can he still be considered the man that he wishes to be? So this younger brother who is unsure of his future as a man, as a God, as an individual who might become something more, (laughs) <laughs> in his fear and concern because he wants his mother to stop crying. Who don't want your mama to stop crying? He's doing everything he can to not selfishly sacrifice this journey, but he's doing some things that will slow down, maybe take away the risk. Come back with us. There's no need to go prove who you are. Your mother is your mother is Frigg, your father is Odin. There's no need to go out through this journey. You and Nana, come on back with us. Fortunately, the world is so set up that other individuals, once a man begins that journey, once a woman begins that journey, there are other rules, forces, and obligations that tell us, no, you can't really go back. You're going to move forward. And you're going to remember those fond days of childhood. You're going to remember those simpler times. But what's in front of you, that path of growth, is what's important now. Let those fond memories of a simpler time, of being young, of being a child, make you happy and bring a smile to your face. And then double down on your efforts to move forward and become what you're supposed to become. That's what it's all about. (laughs) This brother's not sure if he can do that. To gain the favor of his mother... He tries to stop that process for Balder, but hell, this sun-facing goddess, this goddess that stands at the entry, entry, entry mound, the entry of the burial mound, who faces the sun, think about that, this goddess of death who faces the sun. Balder sits on the high seat of hell. So this goddess says, you know, if everything cries for it, then maybe this journey is not worth it. Maybe we don't need to do this. Maybe he is everything he's supposed to be. If everything cries for him, I'll let him go. (laughs) There she is. If everything cries for him, I'll let him go. But like I said, hell sits in the, uh, Balder sits in the high seat here. He is the shining day sitting in the high seat of hell. Well, perhaps this sun facing goddess isn't quite so anxious to let this go. There are lots of people that reside in Helheim of all stripes. Some of them died at sea. Some of them died in faraway lands. Some of them, like the Iceman, that froze to death in the Alps. Where did he go? Okay, so there's a sun shining there. There's a sun shining in hell, and the daughter of night is there too. That other couple that they pray to when they become man and wife are residing in hell. <laughs> Should she be willing to give that up? Should she be willing to take this boon that has fallen to her kingdom, to all of these people who are in charge in her charge? She has power over the rule of death for all the nine realms. All of these people are not bad. Those are the ones that go on down to the ninth realm, which is Misty Hill. And there's something entirely different down there. But this first one, after you cross the bridge, the noisy river, you engage with the furious battler, you leap over the high wall. (laughs) Now you're in a different realm, a different phase of our existence. You cannot destroy energy. You can only change it. And a great change has just happened to the energy of hell. (laughs) <laughs> but she asks, if the world quick and dead weep for him, then he shall go back to the Aesir, but he shall remain with hell, if any gainsay it, or will weep not. Then her monitor arose, but Balder led him out of the hall. 
So he takes his younger brother. He leads him out of the hall, as brothers will do, the closeness of brothers that walk together and took the ring to drop near. Now, this is the ring that drops eight more just like it every nine nights. This is the ring that will allow Balder to build an army, those great rings of, of loyalty that bind a warrior to a ruling figure and allow them to go fight great wars. Balder gives it back. Balder gives it back to her mother. He took the ring, Draupnir, and sent it to Odin for a remembrance. Remember me. I don't need this ring. You're still the king of Asgard. You still rule as the All-Father. There are still great wars and battles to come. Already, Balder is showing wisdom from his journey. And he sends that back to his father as a remembrance. And Nana, the daughter of Neb, the goddess of night, Nana sent Frigg a linen smock and yet more gifts, and to full a, a golden finger ring. So when a young warrior leaves the home, he always leaves the home with a homespun garment made for him by his mother. And when he takes a wife, she's the one that begins to dress him and make fine clothes for him that are fitting for him to go out into the world and do what he needs to do. This is that real symbol that the man separates from the, he cuts the coattail, so to speak, from his mother. Nana sends Frigg a linen smock to reassure the mother that her, her son is in good hands, that they are truly, well and truly, a couple strong and worthy on this path that they're going on. And one more gift to Fulla, a golden finger ring. And like I said, in an age when mothers and fathers are no longer engaging in that hard work of building men and women, it is brothers and sisters that provide for us the guidance that kind of mitigate the fear of the challenges that younger brothers and sisters have to face. So Nana sends back to Fulla a golden finger ring. Nana is on this journey with a husband. And Fulla, as the young maiden that takes care of Frigg's little foot box, she's going to have questions about her journey, about what it means to be a wife. What's it going to be? Do, am I, do I have what it takes to be a wife? Do I have what it takes to be a partner? What's going to happen? Do I, can I be a mother? Am I strong enough to do these things as a woman? So her sister or Nana or, or sends back to Fulla a golden fingering, a promise of hope, an idea that it's going to be okay. <clears throat> and that's a wonderful, beautiful thing as far as I'm concerned. Then Hermata rode his way back and came into Asgard and told all those tidings which he had seen and heard. Thereupon the Aesir sent all over all the world the messengers to pray that Balder be wept out of hell. And all men did this, and quick things, and the earth and stones and trees and all metals, even as thou mayest have seen these things weep when they come out of frost and into the heat. So we're looking at a changing of the seasons here. So we're looking at... Uh, this this slow freezing as we go from that summer solstice down into the winter nights things are freezing up things are hard and think the earth is getting harder it's getting harder to work with as it gets cold and things begin to freeze it's much more difficult for us to eke out of existence when we've lost the power of the shining day and the daughter of night um in the midst of that cold all of these people of Asgard, in, a, in an attempt to mitigate their pain, instead of allowing him to continue on his journey, they want him back to assuage their own pain. In that instant, not thinking about anything other than, I don't want to hurt anymore. I don't want to feel the loss of my brother, my son. All of you motherfuckers need to weep. And this is the frozen earth. <laughs> so they go across the land and everything weeps. But is that the way it's supposed to be in winter? Are we not supposed to have a cycle, a period of rest, a period of rebirth, a challenge? Are we supposed to, uh, are we supposed to rob someone of their ability to go on a developing journey because we don't want to be uncomfortable? We don't want to have to face an uncomfortable truth about what it might really be like to, uh, have to deal with hardship because that's really kind of what we're looking at with all of this. We have a great group of people who have decided they're great, comfortable in their golden age of Asgard and they don't want to have to deal with hardship. Well, 
now that the shining day is gone, some things are going to have to change, aren't they? Just as it is in our life. Sometimes we might lose something very important to us. Someone we love may have to go on a journey of their own of growth. And we are not supposed to short them of that opportunity, no matter what that happens. They've got to grow and become what they're supposed to become. Our sons and our daughters have to go on their journeys to become greater sons and daughters. They marry individuals that hopefully support them in everything that they do and vice versa. So they can become and continue on and be great couples and have children of their own. Because at some point we also have to go on a journey and we'll have to cross that noisy river and that golden thatched bridge that crosses over into Helheim and deal with Mogodr, the furious battler. That's, that's all a part of the cycle of life. And we've got to continually be preparing for it, that great cycle of existence. As the world gets colder and harder to deal with, it means we've had to take some kind of consideration for the future and prepare for it. I mean, let's be honest about it. Balder had everything laid at his feet. Nothing would hurt him. And the best idea they could come up with for the shining day that nothing could harm was to try it out. It's like a bunch of high school boys and the guy that can bench press 315 pounds. Watch him do it, watch him do it. Yeah, let's get it on. Or a bunch of drunks that say, yeah, I can crush a beer can on my head. The best idea they could come up with with all of their wisdom and foresight and thought was, well, let's see if this will hurt him. Well, let's see if this will hurt him. Let's make a great game and sport of it. They called it worshipful. But is that truly worshipful to test the limits of what the divine might have intended. When you test those limits of our life, sooner or later you're going to find you can go beyond those limits. And that's exactly what's happened. And now he's gone into Helheim. Now he sits in the high seat as the shining day for this different realm altogether. And what he left behind is confused. They're in pain. They don't know what's going on. Now the world's getting colder. Everything, we need y'all to weep, man. I don't know what's going on here. I ain't ready for this. This hurts. Um, I don't know that I can deal with it. Blah, blah, blah. Everything's got to weep. They sent out all these messengers, and they found one giantess called, she called herself Thok. They prayed her to weep Balder out of hell, and she answered, Thok will weep waterless tears for Baldur's bale fair. Living or dead, I love not the churl's son. Let hell hold on to what she hath. And men deem that she was there was Loki Laufeson, who hath wrought most ill among the Aesir. I wonder if that's true. I wonder if that's really the case, that the uninspired human intellect might do that. More often than not, it's going to be just the opposite. Thank you. Stephanie, mm -hmm. the uninspired human intellect is going to do that thing that'll shortchange you from a path of growth. Is this truly wisdom? Is this truly wisdom for a certain cave and a giantess who says, let hell hath what she hold? Maybe we need to be paying attention to that. When we go on a journey and it sucks. We still got to go on it. We can't just go into... <laughs> Kevin will tell you, you can't get in the middle of basic training and say, hey, wait a minute, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to go home. <laughs> yeah, it's going to happen. You're going to stay there, and you're going to finish it out. And it's got to be that way with everything we do. And it most assuredly needs to be do that with the development of our faith. Just because all of a sudden it gets a little tough and I'm not sure about it, we don't get to subscribe to some other idea that supplants the development of our spirituality and our individuality for some idea that feeds our righteous indignation or the ideas that I might get angry and be more important. I'll get angry about this idea and then I'll be all the more important. You know what? I just thought of something. <coughs> I want to congratulate Kevin Long for getting old in as a new Gothi for the Austro Folk Center. That's a job well done, buddy. Good job. Proud of you. Very proud of you. And I hope you enjoy a ton of success with it. And when they call and they ask you these kind of questions, <laughs> you'll know where to go. <coughs> right here to this lore. And then say Ganglary, exceeding much Loki had brought to pass when he had first been caused that Balder was slain. And then he, that, 
and then that he was not redeemed out of hell. Was any vengeance taken for this? Har answered, This thing was repaid him in such wise that he shall remember it long. When the gods had become as wroth with him as was looked for, he ran off and hid himself in a certain mountain. And there he made a house with four doors so that he could see out of the house in all directions. And that's typical of most individuals that subscribe to those ideas of righteous indignation and my anger makes me more powerful than you and I can be more right. They're always looking, they're checking around, they're paying attention. There's a boogeyman around this corner that's going to get me. Whoa, there's a weak, it's a weakness. There's nothing else to look at it as. It's a weakness. When somebody's built a house with four doors so he can see in all directions because he subscribed to an idea that's robbing individuals of their ability to move forward, yeah, you're looking in all four directions all the time. That's no way to live. That's not how we want to live. That's not the hope of any of us that follow this path of also truth. We've got to be looking for a boogeyman under every corner. Baldur's not looking for a boogeyman. He's in an entirely different realm with his partner, with his wife, Nana, who sent those, those tokens of encouragement and reassurance back to where they came from that we're all right. We got this. And that's what we need to be saying when we're talking about Austro. You know what? We got this. We got this. We're going to move through this path of growth and development. And when all of this up here, Asgard, and all this nonsense everybody's engaging in, all burns to the ground, we're going to step out onto this and fields unsown are going to bear ripened fruit and all ills will be forgotten and we will reside in Ropes Battle Hall with the man that killed him and another golden age will be determined. We'll turn those tables back up where they played the games and things are going to be okay. But the individual that's right in the midst of it, it's always very hard for us to take an honest look and an honest appraisal when we're in the midst of that of, of is this really going to move me forward is this really going to help me build for my family and my future and my folk a future worth enjoying and there's the whole lesson of balder there her mother leaves as a boy and goes and talks with his older brother and the path that he's on, that uncertain future that we all have of going to hell, and comes back with encouragement that it's going to be okay. He comes back with the ring, drop near. He comes back with the linen smock for Frigga and a finger ring for Fully. He comes back with gifts and encouragement saying, you know what? He's on the right path. He's going to be okay. But the pain of individuals that say, I, I don't want to deal with this pain. I don't want to have to not be as important in their life as I used to be. Well, there's kind of a short-sighted thing there. And I see that a lot and also true. If someone goes out and does something better than me, is it supposed to be my first reaction that, well, I don't want them to be as important as I am. That's, ooh, I'm, I don't know. I don't know, man. That's kind of a tough one. Let me go screw that up. <laughs> or are we supposed to be developing the wisdom that this uninspired human intellect says that let hell hold on to what she has. Let that individual go on and be as successful as they possibly can with their own train of thought. Give them enough rope to hang themselves. It's kind of what Loki's trying to do here is give him enough rope to hang himself and he won't be that important. There's a, uh, this journey to the afterlife and what comes out of it our idea to, to grow in something better. This encouragement that we have from our ancestors in Helheim, these, these ideas that boys become men by witnessing what happens after death, there's, there's some real important ideas that tie all of this together. And I think the first point that I came up with when I started this discussion tonight was, how are we filling out those ideas of the afterlife for the people that follow this faith. And I think if we read this a couple of more times, I think if we sit down and look at this journey that her mother undertakes and what Balder becomes and what Nana becomes, and then we go on into the Ragnarok aspect of it, of when he comes back, we'll find <laughs> the words we need to be able to utter to individuals who are dealing with the pain of loss. Because right now, they're few and far between. I can't go to someone whose husband died of a heart attack and say, he's in Valhalla now, it's all okay. 
How's that supposed to help her? How's that going to help the grieving widow? How's that going to help the grieving daughter or the grieving son who no longer has a masculine image in front of him? One of the jobs we have with rebuilding this faith of also true is to make sure that we understand that every aspect of our being is fully developed. For us to go bravely into those new realms and new worlds of what we imagined we might become when we became also true, we've got to approach and develop the entire aspect of the individual. And that means what happens to us after we die. So I challenge all of you, when you're sitting here thinking about this faith, when you're sitting here trying to figure out what's going on, stop for a second and get away from the common things that we all see on social media and take a look at what it might mean on this journey to the underworld. Take a look at what it might mean to realize that the shining day and the daughter of night, that truly complementing, competing masculine feminine force also resides in hell, also shines brightly in the high seat of hell. Because we have a lot, we have a lot of loved ones that are going there. We have a lot of people that will, in our lifetimes, die. They will pass away unexpectedly, or they may pass away expectedly. Do we want to shortchange our ability to grow into something after they're gone because we don't understand or we cannot convey what the ideas of death might have been for the 10 or 12 or 15,000 or 50,000 years that these ideas were prevalent among the peoples of Northern Europe? Because it wasn't until the advent of Christianity that doubt began to be placed upon what happens to us when we die and a substitute was offered. You can be whatever you want. You don't have to grow. You don't have to develop. You don't really have to do anything. But in the last instant before you bite the dust, you can fix it all. Like that old snake oil salesman, golly, Billy Tans at work here. I feel it all the time. <laughs> and I, I think, I think that's, um, that's about all I've got for tonight. I mean, that's, that's some pretty interesting stuff, and I hope you guys enjoyed it. And uh, Kevin, you and Heather, you guys be careful on your drive home. We need you safe and sound. Hopefully in November I'm going to come down there. I look forward to seeing you guys. There she is. <laughs>